Welcome, everyone. I'm Richard Shinas, the best family dean uh, of the Dietrich College of Humanities and Social Sciences. Uh, we're very pleased to have you join us for the second webinar in our Dietrich Deep Dives seminar series. Uh, this one features Kathleen Carley and Danny Oppenheimer and deals with uh, social media and misinformation. And it's no coincidence that we put this on April Fool's Day. The idea for this, uh, the, this seminar series originated over the fall and the winter, uh, and it really came out of the fact that there were many, many issues surrounding the election, including voter security, misinformation over social media, concerns about voter suppression, et cetera. Um, and for many of these issues, the information available uh, from the newspapers or the TV really was quite shallow. Um, so we thought it would be a good idea to gather experts to speak in more depth about the issues. And we did not have to look very far to put together a great lineup of our own faculty uh, for the spring. So um, with that, let me turn it over to one of our great faculty, Danny Oppenheimer, who is a professor in our social and decision sciences department, uh, who is serving as our host today. Danny's research investigates how people determine what information to use when making decisions, how they search for information they need and what people do when different pieces of information conflict and, and suggest different conclusions, all highly relevant to today's talk. Uh, and he also, I think, has the best email signature line that says, mortal until proven otherwise. Danny. All right. Um, thank you so much, Richard. Um, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Kathleen Carley, the professor of computational and social science and the head of the Idea Center for Social and Cybersecurity founded by the uh, Knight Foundation. Dr. Carley has all the academic credentials one would expect for somebody of her stature, a doctorate from Harvard and an honorary doctorate from Zurich, hundreds of peer reviewed publications and conference proceedings, and which according to Google Scholar have garnered over 35,000 citations, which for those of you who aren't in the academic game is insane. Um, but you, probably all know her less for her impressive accomplishments within the ivory tower and more for her famous feats outside of the academy. She's perhaps best known for the time that she went undercover and infiltrated the Russian troll farm to expose their operations and thus prevent the spread of misinformation and propaganda by state actors. Although she's also famous for when she caught a hacker ring that had taken over tens of thousands of otherwise legitimate social media accounts for the purpose of spreading misinformation. And she hacked the hackers uh, not only locking them out of the uh, compromised accounts, but out of their own internal networks as well. There's also the time when she identified a botnet that had been pro propagating misinformation and designed software to send it into a feedback loop so it could only send messages to itself. But my personal favorite story is the story of how she reverse engineered the algorithms of an organization that manufactured deep fakes. Uh, these are videos, images, or audio that falsely but convincingly mimics a real person. And she used it to create a deep fake of the site's owner and founder telling his employees to shut the site down, a ruse that they ironically fell for, at least temporarily, thus cutting off an influential source of fabricated news in the days leading up to the 2020 election. When you listen to these exploits, it's clear that her life would make a fabulous movie. Or it would anyway, if any of those exploits were true. April Fools. In reality, of what I've said to this point, only her academic accomplishments are real, although they are so impressive that if I didn't know her personally, I probably wouldn't believe that kind of publication rate Possible. But for any of you who believed anything I said, despite the fact that it's April Fool's Day and that the Dean literally reminded you of that fact about two minutes ago, I hope this little prank drives home the point that all of us are vulnerable to bad actors trying to manipulate our beliefs about the world. The spread of misinformation, particularly through social media, has been a growing problem, increasing partisan gridlock, leading to dangerous and hostile behaviors, and undermining our ability to understand reality. And it is not a falsehood to say that Dr forefront of driving the movement to understand and combat this pernicious phenomenon. She's internationally renowned for her scholarship, advocacy, and training efforts, and I am thrilled to get to hear her talk today on social media and misinformation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kathleen Carla. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Danny. That was great. I hope the talk uh, lives up to um, that great introduction, and thank you, Dean Chinas, for having me. So what I'm going to be talking today to you about is about 
the whole way in which disinformation, misinformation, how it spreads on the internet and how it has been used in recent times, particularly uh, during the 2020 election to actually influence individuals in this country and beyond. Now, it's very common for people to think that disinformation is something new. It just started now, right? Because it's so crazy how much there is of it. In point of fact, disinformation has always been with us. Uh, when uh, Ramses um, car carved this bas relief you see, uh, see up here, he actually was claiming victory over the Hittite people. It actually turns out that was not a victory. It was actually a semi-defeat. But his disinformation has survived the test of time, partly because it was carved in stone. Today, we don't carve our messages in stone. We carve them in social media. And the stories that are told are even more elaborate than Ramsey's and cost much, much less uh, to actually conduct. For example, a very famous or infamous, if you will, disinformation story that has been going around starting in early February is, is the following. Uh, Bill Gates, being a smart man, uh, created the uh, COVID-19 virus because he knew that once it started to spread throughout the world, it would put the world on lockdown, which would cause people to go, go cashless. He also invested in a number of 5G towers because he knew that they could control RFID tags because he already had a vaccine out, vaccine for the COVID virus. And when, he and when that vaccine was injected into you, it would go along with it would be an RFID tag and the government or the Bill Gates of the world would be able to actually control you through these 5G towers. Now that's an example of disinformation. Of course, it's not true but it contains elements of truth, which is one of the things that makes these elaborate ruses that are going on so difficult to contend with. You know, there are 5G towers, the world is largely cashless, the world did go on lockdown, there are RFID tags, but by the way, there are not RFID tags in, in um, your, inje your vaccine injections. Now, disinformation itself has a large number of faces. It's not just inaccurate facts. If it were just inaccurate facts, it would be relatively easy to resolve and to find, right? We can do fact checking, although fact checking does take enormous amounts of search and time, and it's often only best done by human beings rather than computers. But in point of fact, there's many different kinds of disinformation. Everything from inaccurate facts to doctored images or fake videos to you know, the use of information that is just simply out of temporal context or things that are things like misleading anecdotes. Satire is often, often referred to as disinformation as well. And in point of fact, when we think about the whole space of disinformation, inaccurate facts are a very, very minor part of it. Deep fakes are extremely rare, although they are becoming more common. And it's not a world that can be solved by artificial intelligence alone. It's one where we need to bring all the different disciplines together and direct new transdisciplinary theories. Some of the, and it's also a world where there are lots of new Denzians of that world who are going to play along with human beings, such as bots, trolls, and cyborgs to help spread and counter the spread of disinformation. To understand the spread of disinformation in social media, it's important to understand how social media is organized. Social media is organized into a series of these topic-oriented communities or groups. Each of these groups are very ephemeral. They come and go a lot like restaurants, but they're a group of people who more or less talk to each other about more or less the same thing. So you'll have one that will form around plane spotters. Uh, plane spotters is a very active one of these communities, but it has, it has a very long, it's always there, it doesn't go away. In contrast, you have ones that form around the royals and the royal weddings in England, and those kind of come and came and went with the wedding. You have other ones that come and go with a lot of things, and we find these regardless of which media you're on. The point, though, is that they can take a pathological form. And that pathological form is an echo chamber. And, and in an echo chamber, individuals talk almost exclusively to each other, and they are very focused on a single thing. And what is going on in social media 
is that adversarial actors, bots and trolls are used to actually shift topic groups into these pathological echo chambers and then prime them uh, with disinformation so that they will act in particular ways. So if you can actually shift a group by changing who they're talking to, you have set the stage for spreading disinformation. Some of the key ideas and the key things we look at in the space or to what extent someone, a group is actually an echo chamber. And in an echo chamber, again, you have this kind of all to all communication. The extent to which you have these actors who are super spreaders of information. They're individuals who have a disproportionate ability to get their message out. It doesn't mean people believe them. It just means when they make an announcement, you know, it's going to go into the inboxes of billions of people. And then you have these other actors, we call them super friends, who are engaged in two ways interactions. Like I talk to you, you talk back to me. I send you a message, you send me one back. These individuals are very critical, we have found, in both building and shaping communities. They can make communities more resilient to disinformation. But if a whole bunch of them get together, they actually form an echo chamber and, if, and can actually be um, disarming for the community as a whole. We talk about the pandemic as a disinfodemic because information uh, about disinformation related to the US election 2020 actually started during the Canadian election. It predated the pandemic, but then as the pandemic began, the amount of disinformation just exploded as did the amount of disinformation about the upcoming 2020 US election. And to set the context here a little bit, it's important to understand in previous natural disasters, in previous political campaigns, there was always disinformation online, but it was on the order of seven to maybe 20 different disinformation stories per event. In this pandemic and in this election, there have been over 7,000 different disinformation stories. And, and compared to uh, earlier ones, more of it was political in nature, and much of it was also anti-US and started outside of the United States. Now, it, disinformation tends to follow, in any disaster, it follows a the timeline of what is going on during that disaster, right? So in the case of the pandemic, it first talked about the nature of the virus, then there were false stories about prevention and cures, about government response, and so on and so forth. But it also included more recently stuff about reopening, about the protests and about the vaccine itself. What makes this in part important from the election perspective is that every one of these disinformation stories that were aimed at the US had a very strong political flavor to it and actually was part of a major campaign to actually create partisan divides and to actually um, create polarization in society. In terms of who is spreading disinformation, look around you. It's probably some of your friends. In point of fact, when information gets disinformation comes into the US somehow, it is picked up and respread by Americans uh, to other Americans. Americans spread disinformation to each other more than, than other, any other country in the world, as far as we've been able to tell so far. Bots are also used to spread disinformation, but what bots are used for is they're actually used to accelerate the spread of disinformation from these fake news sites. And then once they send it out into the kind of over global uh, uh, sphere, then people pick it up from there and spread it still further. So they became the initial shouting thing. It's also the case uh, that with respect to disinformation, that the more lethal the disinformation, the more it is associated with bioweapons, the more likely you are to see bots involved in actually spreading that disinformation. It's also the case that if that disinformation originated on a Russian or Chinese and to a lesser extent, Saudi Arabian uh, state sponsored media account, that it is very likely to first get into people's inboxes through the use of bots. That is, there's these little armies of bots standing around those sites promulgating out everything they say. 
I want to point out that bots are not the same as disinformation. Bots are just tools, and they're also can be very, very helpful. Bots have been used, or they have been used to manipulate people. They have also been used to announce to people information such as a tsunami is coming and have actually saved people's life. They're also used to advertise and so on. But bots, cyborgs, which are part human, part machine, trolls, uh, which are people acting under a pseudonym, uh, engage in identity bashing and hate speech against minorities, deep fakes, memes, doctored videos and images are all used in the manipulation campaigns to spread disinformation you know, throughout the world. Another thing that's used is something that people often forget about, and that is subconscious cues. This is the way words are written. This is the use of capitalization or the use of cute kitten images or whatever to make you feel a certain way just based on the context of how the message is written. And because the way you can spread disinformation quicker is by getting people very excited or getting them very depressed or, dis or angry or dismayed. And these subconscious cues are used to do that. So in the influence campaigns that occur to spread disinformation, they exploit three things. They exploit this, the social media technology itself. They exploit your mind and the way your mind, the human mind works. And they exploit the way people think about it makes sense of, this, of, the, of the world as a whole. They exploit the technology because they take advantage of things such as the prior prioritization rules, the scroll through technology itself, making sure the right messages always end up at the top. They exploit the mind because the messages are, are sent and ordered to actually uh, confirm biases you have, to make people engage in a fear or flight reflex, to actually leave communities and stop talking. And they exploit people's worldview by exploiting social cognition, which is the way you think about the world and make sense of vast quantities of information from a group perspective rather than an individual perspective. And this is done and the way people are manipulated and the way these exploits occur by both affecting what is being said in the messages in social media and who is sending what messages to whom by changing the social network of who is talking to whom, who is important in that network, we can actually do as much damage in terms of spreading disinformation as we can by shaping the message. So it's not just that you need to send lies, you need to construct a community that is receptive to those lies. What is science doing about it? Well, one of the things people have been working on is developing this new framework for analyzing who is doing what to whom with what impact. And compared to, you know, even a few years ago, we're now able to do such things as measure, you know, whether or not uh, who is sending the message. Is that coming from a super spreader? Is it coming from a bot or a troll? Uh, is it coming from a discredited news agency? Who is it being attacked? Is it a community or an individual? Um, and with what impact? We don't just measure in terms of numbers of likes, but it's things like echo chamberness, polarization, mass hysteria. And by did what we're looking, we've now identified 16 different ways in which uh, groups are able to impact others through sending out content that affects, that engages people's attention, that excites them, or that nukes a group and makes a group go away and so on. But let's look at some of this in more detail. And to look at it in more detail, I'm going to talk to you about the anti-lockdown protests that occurred in the United States. These were small protests that occurred in March and early April, April against state COVID-19 restrictions. These, um, you know, we saw one in Michigan, you know, you saw one in South Carolina, we had one in Pennsylvania and so on. By May 1st, they had occurred in over half the states. Now, it turns out these were completely orchestrated events and disinformation played a big role in spreading these events. The way things work in terms of growing a protest is you find a group that is pro and anti on a particular issue, such as pro and anti gun control or pro and anti reopening or pro and anti vaccine or pro and anti face masks. So in this case, it was pro and anti reopening and they embedded bots and trolls on both sides, okay? the adversarial actors who wanted this to be a polarizing issue. So they boosted the size of the groups. Then they sent dismay campaigns on one side, making a group angrier. 
They set distort campaigns on the anti-reopen side, making the group confused, like, why are these people protesting? What's going on? And then they also then created excitement and backed the leaders of those groups, creating a pro-reopen excited group that was so riled up, it was easy to get them to go and act uh, in the real world and indeed to protest. And it created so much confusion on the anti side that there was not a counter protest. Now, part of the way this was done was by spreading disinformation. And in fact, the seeds for those reopen campaigns were laid back in early February when disinformation was actually used to foster hate groups and to build online hate communities. And this was done by sending messages uh, starting out about people who were on ships and people um, and, and about the Chinese. And it led to this kind of uh, led to the increasing hate about China, about about the Chinese and, and against the government, particularly even then it was started about, oh, we think they're gonna try to control us through this pandemic. And that laid the ground. It also laid the ground for a hate movement against science in general. And science became, started to be portrayed as the enemy and that, and that it was science that was at fault for having the lockdown. And it was science that was at fault because science didn't have the right models. Okay, and most of this spread and most of this anger at science was being spread, not by humans, but was being spread by bots. And they would come up with all these incorrect and fallacious stories to do that. Then as we got closer to the lockdowns, what happened is you had uh, the issuance of the national reopening guidelines, which of course people started talking about it. That's not surprising. You would get a peak in people talking about it. And then when then when then you had Trump sending out liberate a set of tweets about liberate America, you know, we want to avoid these lockdowns, you again had a you had a huge spike. But what's happening back behind the scenes is that there's all these new accounts are being set up. And these new accounts are largely on the pro-protest side and involve a large number of bots. They are highly coordinated. And on the pro-protest side, the pro, you know, the anti-lockdown pro, let's go out and protest it on that side, they are very coordinated and they are spreading information and disinformation about what is going on with respect to COVID, but they're doing it in a particularly political partisan way. The ones that are, uh, that are on the um, let's not protest side are actually beginning to sow confusion and are basically arguing that the governors don't really know what they're doing, particularly the democratic governors. Um, the bots here are dominating the reopen discussion. We know that about uh, in the Open America campaign, 75% of them were bots, uh, or 30% of them were bots, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and the same was true in the gridlock campaign. Um, what were they, what were the conspiracies and, re and disinformation they were using? <clears throat> They were, uh, they were using a number of different kinds of disinformation, uh, such as arguing that COVID-19 itself was a hoax, that the hospitals were empty, not overwhelmed. They even had images and videos of hospitals showing carts being wheeled around with no, with no bodies in them. <clears throat> they argued that coronavirus was a, law and that was a lie and was caused by 5G. They were arguing that hospitals were moving mannequins that the pandemic was planned on and on and on. And that was the kind of things that they were sending to this let's protest, this anti-lockdown kind of group, getting them riled up because saying you're being locked down for no good reason. And of course, many of the messages also were became anti-vax and anti-face mask at the same time. At this point, uh, there were many differences that came out between the pro and the anti-protest groups, right? You had more bots on the one side, you had more verified users on the other side, you had more news organizations on the other side. 
you had more people with with what are called default profiles, meaning they're they didn't do any work to set up who they were or their images online, and so on. The pro protest group, the anti lockdown people, were more centralized, more consistent. They had more trolls, bots, booster activities. They had many new accounts. They were always talking about MAGA, about QAnon, about pro-Trump, anti-face masks, vaccine, and so on. So you had all these things come together. Interestingly, they were also looking at more and citing more of news sites that are in what's called the fake news site areas. So there we're talking about things like Breitbart and the U. TU.be. That's, by the way, not the real YouTube. That's a fake YouTube, and so on. Whereas the anti protest group, of course, was appealing to things like the Washington Post, CNN, and the Nation. Now, by the time we get to Pennsylvania, okay, the Pennsylvania protests, and there's good reasons to protest here, right? The small businesses were losing money, the economy was, it was flagging, there were loss of jobs, and so on. But by the time you get to Pennsylvania, you have all these other people involved in this protest, many of whom are not from Pennsylvania, but are claiming they are. So images such as this send a false message, right? Okay, because some of those people aren't even from Pennsylvania. And they're, and they're beginning to talk about rights. They're talking not and not just about reopening. There's new flags that are starting to appear. They're also talking now about Fauci being corrupt and about the Bill Gates conspiracy. And this group was kind of focused around and focused by those particular pieces of disinformation. Uh, this was also coupled with protests against the governor himself. But what rights are they talking about? What they're talking about is anti-face masks, anti-vaccine, my body, my choice, my right. And they thus, at this point, the whole discussion of face masks and vaccine became an issue of rights, and which is a much more powerful argument, but they had used disinformation to be able to transform this into a kind of calling message that people could really get behind. And so now you have people talking about, you know, masks as suppression of free speech and so on. And they're appealing now to people's basic fundamental notions of what it means to be an American, but they did it by spreading disinformation. So why do people spread disinformation? For fun, to alleviate boredom. Some people do it for money. You can pay people to do this. In fact, many of these campaigns were uh, have been done by paying uh, basically uh, propaganda films and marketing companies. It's done to disrupt civil society and to, dis, and to reduce the voice of minority candidates. Disinformation campaigns during 2020 were aimed at every single minority group. They were aimed at the African-Americans, they were aimed at the Hispanic, they were aimed at the LGBTQ community, they were aimed at women, and they were basically trying to reduce their voice and drive them off the discussions in social media. And in some cases, they succeeded. You as a citizen have many things you can do to combat this. You can call it out and not spread it, even if you think it's funny. You can check sources to make sure they're credible. You can look at typos and names, gender mismatch. You can go to Pointer and Snopes, the various fact checkers. You can surround yourself also with known news bots and people you actually know. In other words, don't automatically follow those who follow you and don't accept all friend requests because doing so opens you up to trolls, which will then uh, try to change your mind by spreading disinformation to you. And most importantly, if social media is making you crazy, take a break. Just don't use it for a, while, for a week or so. As management, you want to set up social cybersecurity teams and surround your organization with friends who will support you. Thank you. Danny, over to you. Uh, this has been a really fascinating conversation and we're running low on time. So I wanted to give you just an opportunity if there's any final words or final thoughts or something of hope maybe <laughs> to give to us. Uh, you know, it, it feels sort of like a, it's, a, it's a, a losing battle at some times, but uh, you know, and you've given us some, some concrete steps of things that we can do to make things better. Um, how can you leave us off with some idea that we can, we can make the world better than it is now? Encourage people to read. 
and to read broadly. Because what we find is that some of the people who are the least likely to be Im impacted by disinformation or to fall for disinformation are those who consume large quantities of literature of many, many different types and think very broadly about the world from many different perspectives who have traveled and so on. So the broader your, your point of view, the less likely you are to fall for any particular disinformation. Well, I can see that your background, uh, you know, shows your advocacy of books and libraries and uh, that reading broadly. And you can see mine is not much different in that regard. So um, obviously, and we're, we're totally immune to misinformation. So <laughs> we could have found ourselves going to sleep at night. Um, I want to thank everybody um, for coming and listening to this and especially thank our expert, Dr. Kathleen Carley. Uh, it's a really wonderful of you to um, share your time because we know that you were really busy working to solve the problems that you talked to us about today. Um, and I see that uh, a link has gone out to the uh, idea center, the social security, cybersecurity center that uh, Dr. Carly runs. And uh, so that if you're interested in following up on this, I know that there are other training uh, exercises that are run through ideas uh, for journalists, for uh, children growing up, for anybody. I, I highly recommend people look there uh, and I'm going to uh, now turn it back over to Dean Shines uh, so that he can close us off. Thank you so much, Kathleen and Denny. Uh, that was great. And uh, like, like all good talks, I think that just whets the appetite to learn more. Uh, so so uh, really great job and many thanks. So let me just finish by um, advertising uh, additional deep dives coming up uh, on Tuesday, April 20th. We have a session on cable news and misinformation with our former provost, Mark Camlet, uh, hosted by Kathy Newman in our English department. Uh, a day later on Wednesday, April 21st, Simon DeDeo from Social and Decision Sciences will speak about the psychology of conspiracy theories. And Gretchen Chapman will host that event. And our final deep dive from this spring will be held on Thursday, May 13th. Lisa Tetro of our history department will speak about voter suppression and voter fraud and Kareem Hagag from SDS will serve as host. So you can follow the links on your screen to learn more about these upcoming deep dives and register for them. And we'll be posting videos of each one uh, um, on that page. So if you missed it today, um, uh, or at least the beginning, and if we have other people who would like to go back and look at what we showed today, uh, they will be able to. So, so thank you again for engaging, and we hope you join us for more talks in this series. Thank you again to Professor Carley and Professor Oppenheimer and uh, enjoy the rest of the winter because it sure doesn't seem like spring today. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>